Good afternoon and welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. We have a few quick housekeeping items to cover before we start. First, we're recording today's program and it will be available for viewing on demand later. Everyone who registered to attend will get an email with a link after today's event concludes. All participant mics are muted, so if you're having any technical issues, you can use the chat feature to let us know and we'll try to help. We'd love for you to also use the chat feature to submit any questions or comments you have during today's webinar. You can submit your questions at any time, and we'll try to address as many as possible during the Q&A portion near the end. Any questions that we can't address will be shared with Treasurer Conyers Irvin, whose staff will follow up with you via email. Madam Treasurer, I'll now turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. I'm so excited to see everyone on today. What an important topic. It is February and we're talking about tax season. Um, so while I don't know anyone who actually loves <laughs> tax season, it does come around every year. And the best way to manage it is to prepare and know where to find the resources to get it done if you need help. So that's why today we're excited to have with us Hedy Belkawi of Ladder Up. It's an incredible organization based right here in Chicago that provides hardworking people with free financial consulting resources to help them move up the financial ladder. One of the resources that Ladder Up provides is free tax assistance. And they just kicked off their tax season with free tax preparation services for families earning up to $58,000 a year and individuals earning up to $32,000 a year. Now, you see, I kept saying free, 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 free assistance. This is absolutely amazing. Again, free tax preparation services for families earning up to $58,000 a year and individuals earning up to $32,000 a year. But guess what? We're going to receive some free resources today. No matter what your income is, if you are listening to this um, live Monday Mondays with Melissa, so you are in the right place. The advice that Hetty provides really today is going to be priceless and it's for everyone. So let's jump in. Hetty, I gave a bit of an overview of Ladder Up, but we'd love to hear from, love to hear from you about the organization's mission and why you offer free tax assistance to those who need it. Thanks, Madam Treasurer. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and on behalf of Ladder Up and, and our staff, we really relish the opportunity to talk about taxes. So even though I understand that you or some of our audience members may not want to enjoy this tax season. There, there is a part of me that definitely enjoys this season as a time to really reflect and try to help families really figure out our complicated tax code. So, you know, ladder up a little bit about us. We've served historically over 30 years, over 750,000 clients and secured over $1.2 billion in refunds for low income families across the state. Um, we're really excited by that work. We really want to serve clients more clients than before COVID. Unfortunately, we served less clients last year than our normal amount. We usually typically serve over 20,000 clients a year. Wow. Last year with COVID and the restrictions, we were only able to serve 6,000, partly just we weren't able to be at sites. So this year we're really excited. We're actually at eight sites across the city. Um, another sort of, I think, five or six sites across the suburban land area. And then we're also excited, and I'll talk about this a little bit later as well, to have a virtual service where if you wanna go on completely online, and you know, feel comfortable answering some basic tax questions yourself. We actually have a virtual option where you don't have to come out to our sites and be able to do this from home, you know, provided that you have a scanned copy of your W-2. So we're really excited for those services and 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 really to help families because that's what it's all about: helping families get the refunds and credits they deserve, especially now, uh, Madam Treasurer. When we think about the stimulus rounds, we have several of our clients did not get their third round stimulus, right? The tax return is actually the way that you're able to get those funds that you didn't get or the advanced child tax credit, right? We've heard a lot about those monthly child payments that families got. Again, the only way you get that is by filing a return. So I'm, I'm really excited to be with you and, and to talk through the talk through our services and just provide some help to families that are a little bit nervous, have some trepidation around this upcoming season. 
Yes. So let's start off um, with this initial question of who has to file taxes? Who doesn't have to file taxes? Sure. Generally, I think the rule of thumb is if you have taxable income, right? You worked, you do have to file taxes. There are some income thresholds, right? So if you are single and did not make over $12,550,000 year, in the in the fiscal year, in the taxable year, you do not have to file taxes. Married, that cap is at $25,100. Um, if you are self-employed, though, it's a little bit of a, a different restriction. If you made over $400 as a self-employee, right, you, you work for yourself, you do have to file taxes. And then any Social Security recipient that made over $25,000 a year. Those are the general rules of thumb around who files taxes, as well as if, you know, if someone else claimed you as a dependent on your tax, on a tax return. Okay. All right. Well, what are... You know, you, you've been around, you have the experience. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you know, individuals have when it comes to filing their taxes? And really, how do you help them overcome those challenges? Yeah, I think let's talk about the challenge, right? And I think there is just what you said at the beginning of, of this hour, right? There's a general fear, right? It's it's scary. It's money. And, and I think everyone has that general fear around their finances, right? It's the kitchen table conversation that everybody dreads, right? And tax season is sort of the harbinger of that because we now get scared about the potential of owing back money. Um, I think the other piece to think about is an access question that really is almost sort of um, compounded by the pandemic. Like I think about the pandemic, not as something that's new, because I think a lot of the challenges of the pandemic are things that we've always experienced. But I think what COVID-19 has actually done is magnified issues of access, issues that we've always had, right? So, you know, for low-income families and for families in general, right, there's always this fear of where do I go for tax help, right? Where can I get the support that I need? And generally being scared, right? And, and you know, God bless Jackson Hewitt and H&R Block and several other tax providers that are in our their communities, but there's a fear, right? There's a business, right? What are they going to charge me? Am I going to get my full refund? And I think that, you know, families grapple with that. And, and then there's a fear. Well, then do I file? Do I not file? And I think some people choose just not to go through with it, right? Choose to kind of not get their refund because, you know, honestly, most people that are working that are working hard typically get a refund. So we have to sort of battle back. I think that first that this tax refund process is something that could be beneficial it allows you to get credits that are available to you and those deductions that help you actually bring back money to your family. Um, you know, I do think the other piece to consider is there's a lot of sort of, not a lot, but there, there are some bad actors in the market, right? Where we see the ads for, you know, refund advances and sort of, you know, claims of here's what you're going to get if you go through me as your tax repair. And I think what we want to do is really try to ensure that it's a transparent process, that it doesn't charge someone to get the credits that they deserve. Um, you know, and who's really got their best interests at heart. So, you know, I think part of the question you asked me before too is why, are, why am I in this work? It's really to ensure that families get a free equitable, transparent access to do their taxes, right? That they're going to get what's really, you know, entitled to them. I think a story, if I could just have one minute to tell a little bit of a story, right? I was at a site last week and we had a, you know, an individual single parent who didn't get their advanced child tax credit, didn't get the, um, their third round stimulus for their child that they had in, the, in that tax year. And just the relief to come to us able to see that be applied to this year's refund. And at the end, as we were preparing it, pulled out a receipt. And she said, last year, they charged me $500 to do my return, right? And to think about what that meant for the single income worker who, who's eligible for their earned income tax credit, who's earning, who didn't get their stimulus, that they came to us and got that, refund, got that return for free, right? Without a worry of not getting what's deserved and being able to get all the credits, especially in this pandemic, right? Where there was a lot of government funds available for families to grapple and to see that being able to be given without any surcharges, without fears of additional loans and other pieces that are out there in the marketplace. So, you know, I think we have to get over the fear and then know that there's options available and not just ladder up, right? The IRS does offer a free file program um, where if you feel comfortable, can go through those questions. And then now we are offering a virtual process too with ladder up, but there are options out there 
that don't involve sort of, you know, any usury or anything like that. And, you know, TurboTax and Turbock are reputable things that you can do and, and they help you, you know, work your way through. Just just be wary of all the additional fees as that happens and goes through as you go through the process. And that leads to my next question about the different fees and stuff. Let's talk about individual fouling um, versus um, a tax professional. But I was just listening to you talk, Hetty, and I was thinking, wow, I can see why you love your job because that story that you just told, to be able to help someone, especially those that may be a little intimidated by the tax process, mm -hmm. it really does mean a lot. And what you do, your work is very important. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, but you, you spoke a little bit about um, do-it-yourself options. Yeah. How do you think it's useful to work with a tax professional um, instead of, for example, filing your own taxes with one of the do-it-yourself options online? Yeah, I, I think the distinction for me, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with tax professionals and preparers for their taxes, right? There's nothing inherently wrong. I think the issue is, you know, what are the services being charged for, right? If you're being self-employed and there need to do extensive work, right, with your receipts and reimbursements, I think tax professionals can provide a lot of assistance and support around what that looks like, right? Um, and also, I think a tax professional can be helpful for people that don't understand. I just think we have to watch where that rate is as compared to the actual refund that you're given. And especially for low-income filers, because the IRS, the federal government, the city of Chicago, who's also one of our grantors, really wants to ensure that people that are getting their earned income tax credit, which really is kind of the cap limit around 40000 a year, don't have to worry about those fees. It's a very simple return, right? They're processing their W-2. Sorry, we're getting real technical. Their W-2, which is that, you know, that receipt of that annual income and a standard deduction, right? The IRS allows individuals to receive just a standard deduction for all the possible um, expenses that they could occur. And for most filers, that's going to be their return, right? So the idea of that example I gave of someone being charged a $500 preparer fee when really they were just getting a standard deduction at W-2 is, is really not fair, right? I think that's how I would how I would approach it. So, And then I, also, what type of rate is that? It probably took that professional to do a, a tax of something like that. 15 minutes? You 15 know? to 30 minutes typically, I mean, right? You know, I think like, so you just have to be wary of that. You know, I do think that, you know, there are tax providers that provide a fair and reasonable rate, right? So there are reasons to do it. There's confidence. So I wouldn't scare people away from filing their taxes. Just be wary of what those rates are and think about what you're giving them in light of your return, right? Because and you know what, Hattie? Let me, let me jump in here. Right. I think sometimes we, I, I've heard people, like you said, even if it's a simple 15 to 30 minute preparation, but if someone is getting what they may perceive as a large return, mm -hmm. then they think, oh, $500 is nothing, nothing. to give this person, right? Mm -hmm. When in fact, that's actually not true. You should look at the service, the complexity, et cetera. That's a exactly. good point. Yeah, look we'll at the complexity. And I think, you know, we, and not to make it a plug about us, but we're also providing that for free, right? There are agencies and, and groups that are doing it. I think actually even, you know, TurboTax has allowed for a $0 free file, right? The careful part is when you go through that process, they're quick to kind of throw in, would you like to throw in an extra $20 for this additional prep? So you just need to be careful with that, but there are legitimate, tax prepared professionals, but ladder up can be that, right? We can be that for free. We never, ever, there's no complimentary service. We are a not-for-profit. We do not provide a, a fee for our services. So there are agencies and sites across the city that are going to do this for free, that allow you that support to talk to somebody like me or one of our volunteers or staff to actually understand what they're getting, right? Our tax services actually provide a quality review process where we actually spend time to talk through the individual sent for you. So every client at the end of our services understands why they get it, why are they getting this refund or in those chances where they owe, why do they owe? And also connecting them with other supports, right? I think that's the other part that's missing is that, you know, if they're going to someone to get other supports, that's great, right? But, you know, what are the other supports that families need? And what we found in our 30 years is, you know, are those supports about banking? Right. Like a lot of our clients come to us under bank. One of the things that we do at our sites is also ensure that we're trying to do a direct deposit of, of their refund into a, a valid checking account, because that's actually another sort of kind of sign of those extra charges. Right. If I'm going to the currency exchange to kind of get my refund in, that's not really a useful use of my funds. Right. You could be going to a bank 
having a secure account. Like some of our clients, right, don't understand about FDI insurance rates, right? They think that banks are somewhat unstable and they're going to lose their money, right? So I'm hopeful to try to make sure that our clients understand all the resources that are available to them as well. That should be part of working with financial professionals. Wow, Hedy, that is, you said so much, right? Um, it, it just, um, just really buzzwords for me when you talk about underbanked, um, when you talk about, first of all, be, be mindful of the prepare of fees. And then second of all, when you do receive this check, please do not have to go to um, any of those institutions that are not necessarily traditional banking institutions where you may have to pay more money mm -hmm. to even get your check cash. That's why we want you to do direct deposit. There are so mm -hmm. many accounts. Oh my gosh, you said so many things, Hetty. I, I think you said yeah. it perfectly. I don't even want to restate it. <laughs> well, um, thank you. I think you know we do partner with several of our banks that offer free checking. So one of the things that we do at our sites is we partner with some of our local banks that offer zero fee checking accounts, which we think are really important for our clients as well. And any, any client to make sure that awesome. they're not paying additional fees in those bank accounts. And the other thing to consider as well is, you know, savings, right? One of the questions that we ask, and we're always kind of, kind of look at it and just think about it. A lot of our clients come to us with what are they going to use their refunds for? And, and a lot of it is for sort of, you know, necessities and required, you know, requirements and consumption level items. And we're, we try to push the idea of savings, right? What are you going to do to save this money? Right. We, we, we see our clients come back to us year over year. And while that's great to see our same individuals year over year, I'd like to see that change where I don't see them. I'd like to see them qualify out of our services by doing the smart financial moves that are available through savings, credit counseling, and those other pieces. So, you know, if they're getting those services from financial preparers, that's great, right? But, you know, that's what we really would want to see happen. I love it. You say you want to see them qualify outside of your program. You yeah. want to see them do better and escalate. That That's great. Patty. And that's when you see a tax repair, right? Like yes. that's the flip, <laughs> right? When, when you're able to move out of the standard deduction, right? Yes. You in your own home, you have your property tax re re um, reimbursement, right? You're sort of getting, you're getting those credits. That's when you'd want to see potentially going for a preparer, right? It's not for a simple return. You have one W-2, you're applying for a standard deduction. That's the flip, uh, Madam Treasurer. One W-2 standard deduction. Let's be mindful of that. And a lot of people do say, Hetty, oh no, I want to go to um, a private person or a for-profit, right? Mm -hmm. Where I have to pay because they have more tips or they know a little bit more. Don't You hear that, don't you? I hear that. And it's sad because like I look at our record, right? Like last year we returned $14 million right wow. to our clients 6000 clients that's roughly an average of over 2000 of a refund per client that comes through our door right they're not losing money by coming to a not for profit it's quite the opposite not for profit but but you you do know Hetty, that's what they say right yeah. so i'm glad we we addressed that. and they're not thinking about that $500 receipt right they're not yes. thinking about what they're actually giving up for that 30 minutes of time yes exactly all right. Well, we're really being proactive here because it's something that this was a very important topic that I wanted to present, Hetty, because I know that while it's early February, um, I know that some people get a head start, some people don't. Yep. Uh, but let's just say that tax day arrives and people feel like they need more time. What mm -hmm. are their options? They well, can file an extension, day, right? Is oh, it go April? Ahead. Go ahead. Do we know when is tax day? Yeah. So April 15th is still the universal sort of the end of tax season, right? Okay. I think it's been extended to April 18th because it falls on a weekend. Okay. Um, but the issue is that they file, they can file an extension that, that is available to all taxpayers. But, you know, the extension deadline is normally October 15th. So you get sort of okay. an additional quarter to fill it. Um, it's a very simple form, right? And again, people always have that fear of the process, right? It's really just a form 4868. Um, they still need to file the extension before April 15th, which always kind of throws people off. Like you still have to be aware that you're not going to make that deadline um, and include your personal information and your estimated tax liability. So here was my rule of thumb on that, Madam Treasurer. It really shouldn't be for individuals that are expecting a refund. If you're expecting a refund, likelihood is you have your W-2, you've already withheld you should be getting your taxes done before April 15th. Um, you know, filing an extension is really, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. You know, you are self-employed, you own a business, you're, you, you, you're still gathering a lot of your paperwork that's required in terms of your expenses, the logs, those pieces, and you need that additional extension to get your done. 
again, single family, you know, family type of households, I would still push to try to get your taxes in before April 15th. You know, it's just an extra step. It's not a bad step, but you know, I think that there's some resources out there to help you get that done. Good information. Good information. And if you go beyond April 15th and the government owes you money, hey, they're making money off the money they owe you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that, right? Yeah. Think, you know, the so, idea that, you know, withholdings kind of come into play. And I have some tips around that as well. But, you know, yes, you know, I think get your money is always yeah. going to be the, the general financial ed tool is money available to you now is better than money available to you. In the yeah. Moment, right. Okay. You're able to do stuff with that money. Right. So. Why not get it done as soon as you get that W-2, you know, schedule that time to either, again, you could go to a preparer, but you can come to our ladder up sites. You can, there's a lot of free sites out there that allow you to do your taxes for free. And okay. I think for most people, it is an option and, you know, reach out. There's a lot of resources online um, as well, not just ladder up that'll help you kind of support your way through that process that don't cost money, right? Let's keep mm -hmm. reemphasizing that. Okay, so let's th let's think about we're living in a day, especially this pandemic, really encouraged entrepreneurship. Yeah, right. Um, we have entrepreneurs, independent contractors, people that do not necessarily receive a salary yep. every month or a W two from an employer when yep. the tax season rolls around. So, what are some of the special circumstances involved when they file their taxes? Well, you know, there are some similarities, right? You know, most of those um, self-employed individuals are going to receive a 1099, right? When we think about ride share and others are working for Amazon, some of those other the things that popped up during the pandemic, they're going to they're going to get a 1099, which kind of serves as a W-2, right? It, it, it It's not that much different. It's just a different IRS form. But it, again, it throws people off. There's four numbers. It's going to, you know, people are going to get a little scared, but it's pretty much the same thing. For those that don't get a 1099 with, say, cash workers, they still need to self-report. Like, there's always that misunderstanding of like, oh, I got paid under the table. It still technically needs to be reported. Um, again, we talked about it. The filing threshold is anyone over $400, right? So, you know, if you if you worked and it was over $400, you do need to report along IRS lines. And, you know, the thing that they need to think about is they have to keep track of all their expenses, Right. You know, mostly all of them are eligible for deduction. If it's a legitimate business expense that's linked to that that self-employed work, it's going to be eligible for expenses that work against your taxable income. That's how it works, right? The IRS isn't going to tax you for things that you deducted against, right? That's how the process works. Um, you know, they have to keep records. That's the number one thing we see, um, Madam Treasurer, because, you know, the most audited individuals are those that are self-employed that submit a Schedule C. So you just have to be aware, right? You kind of do have a higher threshold, right? You are submitting all these expenses. It's just more likely that the IRS will take a second look to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Um, you know, the other piece that we really should consider with self-employed individuals is if they know, right? A lot of this didn't happen with the pandemic. They just decided to make that move. But what the IRS does allow, if you know in the upcoming year that you're going to be self-employed, you have that side business, you, you are doing ride share, you are doing some of those other things that happened during the pandemic, you have the ability to make estimated tax payments throughout the year. So you can not owe a balance at the end of tax season. Estimated payments can be made quarterly. The IRS has done a lot of work to make this easy. It's actually the 1040 ES form, which is available online and you can do it online via the IRS website. Very good information, okay. Um, now, I, I thought about a question that was a follow up to the question we were sure. talking about. Well, I thought about something as a follow up to the earlier question where we was talking about um, the deadline. And I said, well, if, if the government owes you money, um, you, you really want to get that back as soon as possible. Yeah. Right. Um, but let's talk about, um, let's say the bottom line on the 1040. And it says that the person owes money. Yeah. Um, yes. Does the resident have to pay it all at once? And what if, let's say, what if you don't have it? <laughs> doesn't do it by the deadline? Are there yep. options? And what are the consequences of not paying on time? There's a lot of things. So I think the first thing is take a deep breath, right? To those individuals, <laughs> right? Because no, it's scary. Yeah. Right? When you get that, when you complete, you're with a tax preparer, you're with us, and you kind of see that tax liability owed, it's, it's scary, right? Because you weren't expecting it. Again, most people, we expect that refund. It's common. It's in our common pop culture, right? Oh, tax season, I'm going to get a refund, 
right? So, you know, it is scary. First thing is take a breath. No, you don't have to pay it all at once. You can make multiple payments up to the 15th. After that deadline, the IRS does start assessing interest, but that interest can be lowered by setting up a payment plan before the 15th. So you can before the 15th of October, April, April, April. you know, okay. you still want to file before. So there's almost like two tracks, right? So, you know, you could file an extension um, and then to avoid the interest payments as well. But let's say the classical thing you did file before the 15th, you're also going to try to set up that payment plan before the 15th. If you do wait to October 15th, yes, you can still do the payment plan after that October 15th. But, you know, we're still sort of working through that. The payment plans are actually pretty easy. You can do it over the phone. Um, IRS wait times are a bit long. There are other options in terms of some forms that you can submit with your IRS. A lot of those tax repairs and like TurboTax and others do allow you to do that as part of the process. Um, you know, the other thing that I would really want to push though um, for people that can't afford it, services like us at Ladder Up, we actually offer a tax clinic, which means we actually offer pro bono legal representation in cases like this, where you feel that this was wrongly assessed, right? You did your tax return and for some reason, you know, either through hardship, right? You just can't afford that tax, that tax levy. We'd be able to negotiate with the IRS on your behalf. Again, there are services, pro for-profit services that will charge them for that, but we actually do that pro bono for free. Or that, you know, there is some addendums that we could help you file. There are other considerations that need to go in. And again, our tax clinic would work with you on. So that would just be reaching back out to us, right? Um, and we'd be able to willing, we'd be willing to represent you to try to work with you to try to negotiate down that liability. That's not really commonplace. A lot of people don't know that. The IRS will negotiate that down. Um, you know, varying you have the paperwork. You can't just I want to negotiate it down, right? You got to have some reasons. Um, but there is that ability out there for people that owe that, you know, maybe that there were some other considerations that weren't filed or hardship. Hardship is something that you can negotiate with the IRS around, but you have to prove it, which, you know, people sometimes, you know, you know, yeah, it means you're going to give up your bank statements. You're going to have to kind of go through that process to ensure that you actually can show that you have hardship is why you can't pay the tax bill. So that's interesting because people think, um, government, IRS, they would not think that that's an organization that would negotiate. I think that's a really good point that you brought up, Hetty. Well, you need that. So why we provide the service, right? If you didn't provide pro bono free representation, you're going to pay an attorney to represent you, right? Most low income families aren't going to have access to do that, right? We just talked about they're choosing not to file. They're going for the easiest option because they, oh, I'm going to get money and that's what I'm going to do. So usually when low income families get that tax bill or any income family get that tax bill, it's, it's scary, right? We get paralysis. What are we going to do? Oh, I got to pay a lawyer. Is it just easier to pay that that bill? We don't think that, no, no, can we file an amendment? There were other expenses that should be applied, right? Or, you know, I legitimately have hardship. I'm not working. I'm on disability. I can't pay this tax bill from a few years ago. Those are the situations that we'd like to take on and support. Wow. That's great. So again, just reach out to Ladder Up. Um, the information is on our website to give us a call and our, our tax clinic. We have a pro bono attorney and paralegal on staff that's really excited to represent people. Again, free, capital F-R-E-E, -E, uh, free of charge for families that, you know, may have unfortunately got a con IRS controversy. And what's your website again? GoLadderUp.com. GoLadderUp.org. Sorry, dot .org. I should dot .org. Okay. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry. Go low. It's all good. Go ladder up .org. Oh, Okay. I, I see the note on the screen. Thank you. This is awesome. Okay. So now let's talk about the opposite outcome. <laughs> and <laughs> you find good out news. That a refund. This is a more better outcome. Yeah. So everybody loves the big refund check. Of course. But, but some people say that if you're getting too big of a refund, that means that you need to adjust your withholdings so that more of that money is going into your pocket each month rather than making you wait until the end of the year to get what's yours. What do you think about that, Hetty? So in theory, anytime you get a refund, right, you, you basically provided the government money interest-free in that amount of time. We like keep talking in, about that, right? In theory, in theory. Yeah. Well, you're a good resident. You know, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when we talk about sort of middle or low income families, the bulk reason for their refund is actually not their withholding. It's the standard deduction. It's the earned income tax credit. It's your child tax credit, mm. which is not part of the withholding. So the real answer that I would say and we at Ladder Up says it truly depends. 
right? Okay. If it's really due to overwithholding, right? You're not receiving the earned income tax credit. You're not receiving the child tax credit. You're not receiving the mortgage interest deduction. Then yes, it could be a matter of readjusting your, um, your W-4 to adjust your withholding. But for the vast majority of individuals, uh, Madam Treasurer, it's not that. It's these tax credits. So there really isn't that you're getting too big a refund too often, right? The too big a refund really just comes from the fact you're receiving the earned income tax credit, you're receiving your child tax credit, you're receiving a mortgage interest deduction, you're receiving a property tax deduction. Those are really the key drivers. Um, and especially now with the pandemic, there was just people that didn't get their stimulus tax, right? So imagine you didn't get the three rounds of stimulus, you didn't get your child tax credit, you could have a very large refund and it isn't because of your withholding status. So again, what we would say is we would want to look at your W-2, we would want to look at your financial conditions before we would make that step of that recommendation. What we would hate to see happen is a lot of individuals suddenly, you know, minimize their withholdings because they think, oh, I'm just going to keep all this money and then wind up with a tax bill. And remember, the IRS will charge interest if you can't pay, right? So, you know, there is a real financial sort of uh, disincentive to try to minimize your withholdings to the point that you're going to actually be liable to pay the IRS back money. Nobody wants that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the things to consider. Wow. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the entrepreneurs and, and independent contractors. Mm -hmm. I want to make certain that we address the small business owners, uh, mm -hmm. especially the new ones, right? The new <laughs> small business owners who might be filing taxes for their business for the first time. Yep. What are things that they need to be aware of? Well, the first thing is, taxes. yeah, the first thing is, you know, how are they actually sort of registered as a state? If they, are they just a sole proprietor, which basically just means that nothing typically changes, right? They're filing as a self-employee and we kind of talked about that they're self-employed. So, you know, they're still filing one return. However, for most small business owners, they're actually either registered as a partnership, a limited liability company, a corp or an S corporation, which means basically that there's going to be two filings. There's going to be their filing as an individual. And then there's going to be their filing as a corporation. And unfortunately, there is a lot of sort of files. And that would be back to that second question, Madam Treasurer, where you probably are going to want some tax professionals to help support your effort, right? You're, there's other additional filings. You're also going to provide W-2 to your employees, right? You may have 1099s, um, NECs or 1099 MISCs that need to go out to your contractors that you employed right? So there's just a whole host of other forms. There's generally some rule of thumb, right? You're going to need to keep your expenses. You're going to need to keep some sort of income expense tracker, QuickBooks, some of those other services that are out there to provide to make sure you have a record. Um, you're also going to need, if you have mileage logs that are going to sort of associate what you've done to travel as part of your business, there's just a whole host of documents that you're going to provide. Unfortunately, I set ladder up. We'll do some support, right? We'll come out and talk about that. But this is really where you're going to want to go to some of your business bureaus out there that are really going to provide some additional resources around sort of small business tax preparation. So I would say the general rule of thumb is keep records, use some sort of financial tracking software, um, and, you know, really just be sure that you're just you're, you're on the up and up in terms of your record keeping. Right. And, and what you're doing, because that's a whole other sort of set of forms and requirements. And, and, and you do need some tax professionals. You do need some support around a small business preparation. OK, very well. Well, um, I think I got two more questions and then sure. we'll get to any questions that the audience may have. Mm -hmm. uh, be sure to um, type in your questions in case you have any. Um, let's talk about planning for next year. Yeah. What kinds of things, I'm already ready for next year, I'm looking at <laughs> that. What kinds of things should people, because some people may be, may be listening to you saying, man, I should have done this, I should have done that, but we're in tax season now. Yep. So what kind of things should people be doing now to make sure to make certain that the tax season next year goes more smoothly? Yeah. So I think let's talk about self-employed, because I think with this pandemic, a lot of people have kind of migrated into this category. Right. Again, some sort of logbook. You're tracking in your income and expenses. Right. And you have another log to sort of do that. And you're really sort of you know religious about it. Right. Every time you have an expense, you're tracking it, you're saving a receipt. A mileage log is important. We see a lot of people that don't do this, and then they're left to try to, you know, retroactively create where they think they've driven in light of that self that self employment income that they received. 
keeping all receipts and bills. There's a lot of great apps that allow you to scan them over, right? You're not just keeping, I still remember, you know, there's that lovely like orange folder that we kind of like threw receipts in. There are some apps out there to help you sort of digitally track your receipts and keep them for safekeeping. The other thing that people don't sort of think about is a separate bank account um, for their business income and expenses, because that's going to serve as that additional log of expenses that you're able to pull up and save. And it keeps it separate from all other income that you may be receiving, especially for those that maybe have like they're getting a W-2, but they have this other sort of income that they're getting on the side. Another bank account might be helpful around that. And then the other recommended is start making those quarterly estimated tax payments. That's the biggest problem we see is people don't do that. And then now they're facing a large tax bill at the end of the year. So, you know, please go online to irs.gov. There's a lot of information about those estimated tax payments. Again, nobody likes to pay, but the issue is that that's really the best recommendation for those that are self-employed. For those that aren't self-employed, you know, I think it's just general good financial tips, right? You want to save a copy of all your financial documents, save your W-2, right? Um, you know, review your withholdings if you owe money, right? I think that's where it's actually the other way, Madam Treasurer, right? If you found that you owe money at the end of the year, I actually, that's where I would recommend maybe upping your withholdings. So if you owed in the previous year, that would be a kind of dead giveaway for me to maybe think about that. Um, and then if you move, you know, that's also something we see, I didn't get my W-2, I moved, you know, keeping your address current with your former employer, your employer, and with the IRS. Again, you can do that online at irs.gov. It's the form 8822 to make sure that, you know, that everyone has those records moving forward. Um, you know, the other thing to think about, there was a lot of information this past year. So I don't know if it applies to next year, but it applies for this tax season, you know, uh, did you get your third round stimulus, right? Did you get those advanced child tax credits if you're eligible for those those credits? Because that's that's the big sort of available credits that are out there right now. And it's going to be interesting. And I don't know if it's something to prepare for, but it may be this weird experience where you got a pretty decent refund this year and you're not going to see that same refund next year. So maybe there's some caution around what people are eligible to get this year that they're not going to get um, next year moving forward, you know, despite maybe maybe there be some political um, movement on the federal side. But right now, there also could be that kind of negative downward effect of not seeing those same type of credits moving forward. Very well. And, and I just noticed that we do have a few questions. And, and I have one more question before we get to sure. the audience questions. But it's so interesting. I didn't realize that I can see the audience questions right here. Yeah. <laughs> I see them too. That's great. You know, I learn something new every day too. Okay. Um, so my last question before we get to the audience questions, um, it, it's 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 maybe the most important, I think, of all. Sure. How can those who qualify meet with a lot a ladder up professional to get oh, their taxes filed? Sure, sure. Um, so on our ladder up website, we list all of our locations, right? The eight across the city and five um, in the Sub Suburland area. Some are what we call walk in and uh, like our Harold Washington site where we are there basically Monday through Thursday and Saturday, um, where you would just come, right? You need to have your identification and your W-2, and you would just come in our hours, and we're going to provide you a, a free tax return, right? Um, there's also what we have our appointment phase. We have several of our sites that are appointment phase, where, again, you either would give us a call or through the website actually reserve your tax appointment right? Where again, you know, you don't have to stand in line, you would just pick a date and time and come to those locations on the date and time that you made that online appointment or to be a phone. And we're going to do your taxes then. We also have our drop off services where it still is appointment, but you will drop off your taxes. And then in one business day, we're going to provide you a tax return. And then there was that last piece that virtual on your own model, what we're calling our ETAP services where you would scan your W2 and your identification answer you know a series of questions that you would answer yourself anyways either at our sites and again in one business day we would be providing you a completed return you know depending on everything if everything's above board and we can we can complete your return without any questions that last service is actually where we're really excited it's part of that irs free file limit where it's actually up to seventy three thousand dollars for income that we'd be able to do the return those in-person services that i mentioned are the 32 and 58 that we described in the chat, 32,000 for individuals, 58,000 for um, families. Um, I think there is a question, uh, Madam Treasurer, around if I make over 73, and unfortunately we just can't provide the tax return then. Um, so you'd have to then go 
to a provider. And at that level, there might be some benefits as we talked about to going to a provider to maximize, to ensure, right, that your, you know, your mortgage interest deduction is in, that you're, you're getting the property tax interest. There might be some benefits at that level to provide, um, to go to a provider. All right. We got that question. And okay. So, yep. Very good. The next question, I uh, Go mm -hmm. ahead. I'll let you facilitate. Oh, okay. Sure. Justice had a question. Justice. Go, go ahead, um, Hedy. You see yeah, that? I see it right there. Um, yeah, that was an, an interesting, you know, and it's a smart move. You know what? I don't know if everyone can see the questions, sure. but maybe we should say that. And by the way, this this is a hot topic on social media. This sure. question. Go ahead. So, you know, I think I'll read out the question. Do you want me to, I'll read it out, sure. right? So, Madam Treasurer, Treasurer, I recently read an article saying that January 1st, mobile money apps like Venmo, PayPal, Cash App must report annual commercial transactions of $600 or more to the IRS. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of attention placed on this because of the pandemic and the reality that a lot of people were being paid via these apps, right? And, you know, there really isn't a change in terms of IRS policy here, right? Companies are required to submit 1099s to anyone over $600. It's a legal requirement. So this was just probably an extension of that, right? These apps are the vehicle in which business was transacted. And that $600 limit is just something that was out there. So it is something to be expected. I think, you know, we talked a little bit about it on this call, right? There is this sort of under the table feeling about cash and, you know, I don't want to comment too much on that. You know, all income work technically is taxable. So you, you have to think about that in light of the thresholds, right? $400 or more if you're self-employed. And then companies have that $600 mandatory required filing um, for anything over $600 in terms of compensation. So, you know, individuals just need to know that the IRS is aware that if you've received over $600, that it's going to be reportable. So I thought this was a great question to um, a follow up to the small business and independent contractor questions. Mm -hmm. This person specifically asked, um, is there any other tips that you would give for a person, a small business owner who focuses online, yeah. which, you know, that's like the new day, especially I would yeah. assume the tips you gave is the same, but just want to the same. Sure. I think, you know, I think the the wariness there and it goes back to that kind of, Everything is leaves a digital trace, right? There's going to be a record of that transaction. You're going to have to report it. Um, you know, there there isn't, especially now in, in the year of 21st century, everything is identifiable, right? All of those transactions are, are, I would assume, would be going to a bank account or some sort of either PayPal account. You're going to have a record of that, and you're going to have to show that and submit that if you're going to be thinking about the, you know, those expenses. I think the tip is, you know, every every sale that you make, I'm sure, costs you money in the end right? Like you, you put together a product, right? There's services associated with those products. You, you as a business had expenses. You just want to be equally diligent about reporting those expenses. So you're eligible to take that off of your taxable income when you're reporting that to the IRS. And I think that's where, again, some tax preparers are going to be helpful. They're going to help you think through all of those receipts and what's truly taxable and what's not. Sorry, unfortunately, ladder up. We, we, we provide support if you're self-employed, but I think when you're thinking about that, that kind of, I have a business, it's online sales, you know, there is going to be a benefit to really thinking through some tax preparation there. I was just looking, uh, making certain that th this is really great. We can see all the comments coming from different platforms. I was looking at my phone to make certain <laughs> it's pulling questions from this social media platform this one yeah it, so we we can see them all here so this is awesome so no matter where um the resident is listening they mm -hmm. can actually enter a question and we will get it right here um, you know, I, so really I think the other tips that i'd like to suggest to people isn't solely about taxes it's just about good financial management right and i think we Very talked good. about that at the beginning i think what we see from our clients a lot is you know not really leveraging the financial tools available to them via bank via credit counseling right like that's really where I would rather like us to spend more time talking about, right? It isn't so much, and I know people are really interested now because it's tax season, how I can you know, decrease my tax liability, but where we see the most opportunity is, am I banked, right? How am I using my money? Am I creating a budget, right? Am I, you know, when I think about, you know, am I using, you know, really smart money sense in terms of my expenses of what I need now, right? You know, am I choosing when I do, you know, finance a car or other sort of large purposes. And I really 
leveraging all that's out there in terms of lowering my APR, right? You know, am I am I saving up for the house, right? Like there's a lot of financial incentives for people that are, are thinking about buying a home, right? That people don't necessarily th- kind of think in mind that, that are connected to being banked, that are connected to good management of credit. I'd love for people to think about that too, right? Because I think that's going to have a lot more wins associated than, oh, did I, you know, I got that $20 receipt that I, that I did for that mileage that I did as I was self-employed. I just think that's, that's where I love our culture and thinking about tax season, but I'd also love to turn the conversation there, right? Because that's going to, that's going to help more people. That's going to really truly lift people out of poverty and make more substantial financial gains and really lead to wealth, right? Those sorts of things and not, not, you know, oh, I mean, I love the question about the $600 on PayPal and Cash App, but that's not going to make or break you. What's going to make or break you is the high interest credit cards that you're paying off, right? The the, the ability to save for a home. That's what's really going to lead to wealth. And, and you know, I, I like your answer to the question when someone asked, well, what if a single person makes over $75,000? And you're like, I'm, I'm glad, right, mm-hmm. that those people don't qualify for this program because you want people to graduate out of this program. I think that is mm-hmm. so important of a point that you made, Hattie. Yeah. And you're talking about financial freedom. So if anyone follows Chicago, that they know me, right? Chicago Treasurer, they know that I talk so much about financial empowerment for all. To yep. your point, Hattie, you know, it, it, we don't want the haves and the have nots, the inequities, which I know is what Ladder Up focuses a lot on. And so mm-hmm. I think that this is such an important conversation. But as you mentioned, it's broader than just taxes, right? We're talking about taxes, but we can't talk about taxes without talking about financial freedom. And so all of that is so very important. And I'm glad that you have this service and we're going to work hard together so that individuals can graduate even out of the the service that you provide. But actually, you never really graduate out of the service that Ladder Up provides because you, although you may not um, provide the free tax yeah. preparation, mm-hmm. you still have resources we pro- that everyone can learn from. So we would provide regardless- financial resources. We also, uh, just so you know a little bit more about service too, we also provide financial counseling and support kind of along the lines that I'm talking about, as well as FAFSA coaching, because that's actually the next step of what we do, um, which is specifically around that college process, because that also, you know, kind of stymies these individuals of really understanding the FAFSA form and understanding what how you can really better prepare you know, your sons and daughters around that that next step into college access. So yeah, we provide a ton of additional supports as well. Absolutely. I love it. So regardless as the income of the income, please know that Ladder Up provides resources for all. Make sure that you go to their website, go ladderup.org. Um, such a great, great topic. This was great information. And guess what? We have about, well, before I I go to my other point. I think that's all of the questions I've had. Yeah, they I think so. Okay. So we have about 70 days left until tax day. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Hetty mentioned April 15th. Um, that's the that's the date every year that we know of April 15th. That is also Easter weekend. Um, and so I don't know if there's a holiday. I believe there. 18th. So I, I believe that. Yeah. That so it's the... going into the 18th. Yeah. Yes. 18th, which is that Monday. Yes. Yes. All right. April 18th. So you get three extra days. It's typically April 15th. But let's yes. focus on April 15th. So guess what? That way we know that you'll be on time. Nobody, so, nobody wants to do their taxes on Easter. Manifest, that's right. right. Nobody Nobody wants to be waiting. That's that, right. That <laughs> that's right. Um, but I really want to um, really thank Hetty for all of this information. And... Um, don't forget to go to the website, goladderup.org. Goladderup.org. And then, you know, also if there's other financial services questions, we're happy to to answer them specifically around college access, budgeting, all of those pieces that we've talked about are part of our service package that we provide to anyone, right? But, you know, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Manager. This is awesome. And don't forget, while we're talking about February and tax season, it is also Black History Month. And so the Chicago Treasurer's Office, we have a Black History Month essay contest that is underway. 
It is open for submissions now. So be certain to make certain to be certain, be certain, excuse me, to let your favorite CPS high schooler know about the essay contest. More information can be found at ChicagoCityTreasurer.com. You know that we are always available for you to reach out to us and, and feel free to share this recording. Once we're done, the recording will be on all of our social media platforms. Be certain to share it with someone that can learn from this. Don't just keep all of this personal, great information to yourself. So don't make it personal. Don't and I hope, Madam Treasurer, that we can schedule a time maybe in the summer to talk about those financial resources. That's that great. I'd love to talk about those. So we great. look forward to it, Hetty. That is absolutely wonderful. So we will see you on February 28th for another special Money Mondays with Melissa. Until then, I wish all of you a wonderful, safe, and healthy week. Thank you, Madam Treasurer. Thank you, Hetty. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending. Please join us for our next Money Monday on Monday, February the 28th. You may now disconnect.